sad news this morning uh, that Robin Williams, uh, the comedian and actor, uh, died uh, apparently self-inflicted death, uh, although, again, autopsy reports coming out later on this morning, uh, but um, apparently a suicide. With us this morning is uh, someone who knows a little something about that, Benet Rogers is a contact crisis line, and she joins us here on the Gary Sutton Show on WSB. Good morning, Benet. How are you? I'm great. How are you? You're doing morning. pretty well. P- pretty sad news last night, and, and, and again, um, you have kind of a, uh, a background that has to deal with this kind of thing on a regular basis, right? That's correct. Our agency, like many others um, throughout the country, um, handles 24-hour crisis line calls. And um, a percentage of those calls, you know, depending on the center that you're you're talking to, you know, can take anywhere from 5 to 15 percent of their calls annually are people who are actively suicidal, meaning they need some type of imminent 911 intervention, while the other calls are folks who probably are thinking about it along with their crisis, but um, maybe it hasn't quite come up yet and they're doing some preventative work by calling the line, Um, or maybe it's part of their process of dealing with their challenge um, and they want to talk that through, but it's a really important program that can be found, you know, where we are here in Dallas, but also really all over the country. Yeah, we can find it in in our area here as well. Uh, I read a tweet by Jimmy Kimmel, and he said on Twitter, Robin was a sweet man as he was funny. If you're sad, please tell someone. Maybe that's our starting point this morning, because there's a notion out there that, that suicide is caused by, you know, one disastrous change in someone's life. But I also read that's not almost never the case. Uh, your, your thoughts about that as a person that deals with this? That, that is correct. It's almost never the case that it's a one incident. There are incidences that are so significantly traumatic for someone, but that's fairly rare when we think about the issue of suicide. Most often you're dealing with someone who has been going through multiple um, issues of, of just one thing after another after another, not seeming to ever feel like they can get over the hump, that things ever get better. Um, and so there comes that sense of complete and total desperation that, you know, my life is just not going to get better. I'm going to be a burden on other people. Yeah. You know, I, I should just go ahead and, and solve this problem myself. Myself. But then, Greg, there's the other side of it that is really the mental illness side, the side that when you think about depression in particular, you know, this is a mental illness of the brain. Well, the brain is the very organ we make decisions with. And so someone who's really suffering, like we understand the reports about Robin Williams from severe Mm -hmm. depression, he's making decisions. Those people are making decisions with a very organ that is chemically imbalanced and for, you know, very simple terms, broken. And so it's really hard to understand that, but that's really what's happening. Someone is really at such a place of brokenness in their uh, chemistry in the brain and how the brain is functioning that they really can't make that decision that is what we might consider logical for us. So the decision they end up making seems at the time logical for them. More than 90% of the people who commit suicide have previously struggled with substance abuse, uh, psychotic disorders, or depression. Right. The majority of those who seek help are treated successfully. You mentioned about the brain can sometimes be broken, and we hear about uh, and I had a friend many, many years ago who who did this and uh, and had an, a massive lack of serotonin. And yet, if you looked at him outwardly, he okay. seemed like the most well-adjusted guy in the world. If you look at Robin Williams, we, we would assume that, well, here's a guy that makes us all so happy, so he must be happy himself. But yet, you can't make those assumptions. And sometimes you can be missing something like serotonin or some very important chemicals in your makeup that really cause you to go that way. Absolutely. And I think what we also, you make a really great point. And so people also need to understand that depressed people don't necessarily look depressed right. or act depressed all the time. In fact, it's oftentimes the opposite, that they seem happy. They get them, they're the life of the party. They can make everybody else happy. But that takes so much energy from them. It takes so much of what they naturally produce in serotonin to be happy that when they come down from that, their down is so much lower lower than everybody else's. And so that's in that place where if they don't have some kind of medication or some kind of treatment, whether that's therapy or drugs, to balance that so that their highs don't 
throw them into really significant lows, you know, then they then they end up in this place where their lows are so deep and dark in despair that, you know, they just become overcome by it. I was a teacher for 25 years before I did this, and, and it was back in the early 1970s, I remember, and I was teaching middle school, and I would probably be chastised or fired today. But one of the most important indicators is to, and one that I think is ignored probably a lot from what I read, is whether someone has discussed ending their life. And I remember having a girl in my class who was really a high achiever. Mm-hmm. And she came in today, and she, at the end, the end of the day, she said, you know, I think I'm just going to go home and commit suicide today. Uh-huh. Now, the way she said it, and, and again, being a teacher, trying to discern what's not being said, it, it wasn't something that you worried about, really. And yet, at the same time, today, if someone said that, you you would right away be addressing that. And I said, well, you know, I hope you don't do that. I just, you know, so the next day she came in to class and I said, and I kind of flippantly to her, and I was, again, a very young teacher at the point in time. But I said, you know, I thought you were going to, you know, do suicide last day. She said, oh, I was too busy. I, I didn't have time. I had a lot of homework I had to do. I said, OK. You know, so we dealt with it in a, in a very kind of odd way, but it was not. The problem, but I look back on that time and now being, you know, a little older and hopefully a little bit more mature, I would have dealt with it much differently today than I did then, although I kind of knew that that was not really what she was trying to mean. But you can't you can't really do that too well anymore, can you? Well, and, you know, I think the re- the reality is is that, you know, that was a great situation that turned out well for you, and I'm glad. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the reality is we should always take those comments exactly. seriously. Because it is And that's my point, rare. by the way, yeah. Yeah, it is so rare that someone would go to that extreme to say that, and it could be very well be that you're simply saying to her, I didn't. You know, I hope you don't do that was yes. enough for her. You know, and we also need to realize that people do sort of put taking drastic actions off. They get really busy. They get focused on other things. And then they realize, okay, that's not something I want to do today. So those are really legitimate reasons that we hear from people as to why they've delayed, you know, self-harm to themselves. But any time, particularly yes. a teenager, but any time someone says, you know, I think I'm just going to end it all, or, you know, I we, we tend to shy away from not wanting to say that or go, oh, you're not being serious. Mm-hmm. That is the prime opportunity to say, when you say that, you make me think that you're serious and that you might really hurt yourself or you might complete a suicide. And what we need to know, Greg, is people are going to do one of two things. They're either going to say, oh, no, I, I didn't. I wasn't. That that's that didn't mean it to come out like that. Yep. They'll clarify it for you fairly quickly. Or they'll realize that you just opened a door for them to go, you know what, I do feel that way. And that's a great opportunity to begin a conversation. And I just want to say to your listeners, you don't have to be the one to have that conversation. I think that's really scary for people. But there is a 24-hour crisis line. It's the national one, 1-800-273-TALK, which is 8255. That's the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Dial that number for your friend, for your family member member. Do it for them and get on that phone with them. Just like if they fell down and they broke their leg or they were having a heart attack, you would rush them to the hospital. That's the same thing you should do. You would stay with them. You would walk with them. You would reach out to their family for Mm -hmm. them. That's the same type of support that you need to provide someone that you think is struggling with depression or a traumatic situation they're not dealing with well. And especially you should do that for someone who said to you, and seriously meaning it, I think I want to end my life. And that's 1-800-273-TALK, is that correct? That's correct, 8255. Bidet, I want to, and Gary Sutton with Bidet Rogers here this morning on the Gary Sutton Show. Um, uh, Bidet is with uh, Contact Crisis Line. Bidet, when, when you look at the death of a famous person like uh, Robin Williams, who touched a lot of people in this country, I mean, everybody, young and old, this is a guy across generations and was still right. doing work. Is there any uh, study out there that says that, teens or anybody is now looking at that, and this sounds really strange, but in some kind of tacit way then says, well, he did it, therefore somehow that's okay for me. Sure, absolutely. And I think if you look at uh, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, if you go on Facebook and look at our post, you know, we immediately wanted to reach out to people and say, you matter, you are valuable, we are here for you. And the reason is because people do look at that and they say, you know what, if Robin Williams can't find a reason to to stay and to fight and to push through the pain of the depression and the anxiety or this mental illness, why should I? And so 
that does, for some people, may give them a sense of license to go forward with their plans. While for others, it's kind of a wake-up call to say, you know what, I don't want this. That's not what I want for myself, but I don't know where to go. I need help. So, you know, what you're doing this morning is you're really reaching out to both of those people. Mm-hmm. This is not a, a reason for someone, for you who's listening, to go through with your actions. This is a reason to realize that so many people loved him. So many people wished they could have been there for him right. if they had known. So let someone know. Call a number. Tell a family member. And if you're worried about somebody right now, Greg, the number one thing you do is you pick up that phone, you send them a text, you send them an email, I'm thinking about you, I care about you, because we don't realize how those simple touches can really change somebody's day, somebody's life, and give them just enough to keep pushing through their crisis for that moment. But hey, there are some key factors that can indicate suicidal thoughts, and and we've touched on some of them, but uh, let's go through them just for people who are looking out there and they're saying, well, how do I recognize that? Because as we said, one of the things is we sometimes don't hear someone when they're saying it to us, but the first one on the list is a history of suicide attempts. Obviously, that's a huge red flag. Absolutely. You know, for people who have made an attempt already, they are 20 to 50, and depending on how severe their first attempt was, 75% more likely to attempt again. So if you know someone who has made an attempt, making sure that person is surrounded by support, um, that they know they're they're available, that they have an opportunity to talk open and freely, but really making sure they've gotten into some kind of treatment. Both talk therapy, uh, support groups are amazing, and, you know, if it's necessary, medication as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, those first key things of support and really getting into some kind of therapeutic treatment are really key. I know a pattern of substance abuse also figures in here, uh, particularly if a person has has since, you know, recently relapsed after a period of sobriety. And we know that Robin Williams did have a lot of problems with drugs during his lifetime. Well, and what we also need to realize about a lot of addicts um, and people who have addictions, particularly to, um, uh, you know, some of the more severe drugs, is that they are oftentimes self-medicating a mental illness. And so, you know, so many people who have addiction issues are also having mental illness, and this is why they're addicted, because they're self-medicating their mental illness. Again, they're making decisions with the very oak organ that's not working for them. Yeah. And so, yes, you definitely need to, for a person who's relapsed, for a person who's substance abuse, making sure that person gets into treatment, stays in a treatment um, until they're at a place where they truly can be released if possible. Um, but then again, once they're out, you know, oh, yay, they're better. No, no, no. Those are critical, critical days and weeks post release from any type of treatment, both drug and alcohol, as well as, you know, mental health um, treatment. Those first 72 hours are just so important to surround that person. The weeks after and even the months after, just keeping them connected and keeping them from being isolated and keeping them supported is so critical. One of the things that that you hear people say is uh, a sense of hopelessness, that this will never get better. This feeling I have will never get better, that it's just always going to be the worst and I can't live with that every day. Um, And, you know, how do you address it? I'm sure you hear a lot of that in, in the crisis lines. Absolutely. I mean, that's probably one of the top things people say, this is just never going to get better. And the reality is you, it, it will get better, and it does get better for most people. But we've all been there, Greg, where yeah. we're like, this situation is just never going to get better. And that friend says, you know, it will, and let's talk about the times that it was better. Because for many people, it has been better. They've been through these situations before. And that's a really good time to say to someone, you know, let's talk about what it would look like if if it were better. And that's one of the things that, you know, we try to get people to focus on. If there could be one thing that could change that would be better or make the situation better, what would that be? You know, instead of trying to tackle the entire, you know, process or issue or crisis, finding that one thing and then also helping them remember that there was a time when their life was better, that there was a time when things weren't as bad as they are now and you know that kind of helps people remember you know what we if i could just at least get back to that place where gonna, things aren't as bad we're gonna take a very quick break but we're gonna come back and i want to talk about a few other signs that people can look for sure. and some final thoughts about this but a rogers who's with uh 
contact crisis line. And we have them all over the country in our area as well. Uh, you can call 1-800-273-TALK. Uh, good way of looking at it, right? Uh, talk about it. Uh, we're going to come right back here as we remember Robin Williams, but we also remember him by talking about the idea of suicide, which apparently is what happened here, and uh, how to keep an eye out for what could happen closer to home. I'm Gary Sutton. We'll be right back here with Benet Rogers on News Radio 910 WSBA. the Gary Sutton Show with Panay Rogers from Contact Crisis Line as we talk about Robin Williams and a apparent suicide last night. We were talking about some of the factors that, uh, you know, can indicate suicidal thoughts. And one of them, Benet, is the signs of depression. Uh, and, and they can include, but they aren't limited to, like, fatigue, insomnia, apathy toward, you know, doing what you do during the day, your work or whatever, sudden weight changes, loss of attention span, uncontrollable anger or sadness. Those are all things that I guess we could look for out there, right? That that is correct, and and those symptoms can sound like a lot of other things. <laughs> yes, and yes. So I think that's really important that people are like, well, that could that could be anything. What you want to look for is really symptoms that are lasting over a period of two weeks, and particularly that sadness, that n- non engagement. People who used to be uh, really engaged in an activity, and they're like, just, nah, it just doesn't make me happy anymore. I, nothing makes me happy. I'm sad all the time, and you know, you've gone two weeks with that feeling and you just can't get over it or you're watching someone you know and you love go through that, that's a big sign of saying, you know, maybe there's something else going on here. You're not just being lazy. You're not just tired. You're not just sad. This is really becoming a little bit more persistent. And you want to start looking for ways to help that person identify what, what's driving that feeling and then possibly having them see a professional. You know, one of the ones that I've read a lot about about is uh, sudden calmness, that, that someone gets really, really calm. And um, why is calmness one of the things that we look for? Well, oftentimes calmness in response to something that should in- excite a different type of response. So I am suddenly very calm to something that would otherwise really upset me, Mm -hmm. really make me anxious, really uh, make me angry, or, or even make me excited. You know, and all of a sudden my response to that is, you know, that's great. That's wonderful. Uh huh. That is someone who's slowly, um, I guess the easiest way, checking out. You know, they're, they're not engaging. And that is a real significant sign. You know, that isolation, even in the middle of a room, you know, that non engagement yes. into what what we would call normal reactions to situations in life. If you're saying to someone, this this is not normal, why are you calm? You know, that's not something to get mad at them about. That's something to be concerned about. You know, okay, you're calm. This is not normal. Let's talk about why you're not reacting to this the way you would normally. And and you want to be mindful of if this is their normal response to things, okay, then it's probably normal. But if normally they're on the, you know, the opposite end of the spectrum and now they're sort of sinking in the middle, that's when you want to be concerned. And one of the things I know in reading about depression that that people feel is uh, a loneliness even amidst the crowd that, and and the idea that it's hard to think that anybody could help you again. That kind of combines with that hopelessness that we were talking about earlier. And and so you have to find, you have to, first of all, know that there is a way out, that there's a way to get out of that, but, but you can't be afraid to enlist people to help you, or maybe even just help by being there with you at the moment and, and just comforting you until you can get maybe a more expert help at that time. Is that a fair statement? That is a fair statement. You know, if you're feeling like every time I'm in a crowded room, I feel like I'm completely by myself, that is not what, you know, should be a normal response. And so, you know, saying that to someone, sharing that with someone. But I think what's really important here, Gary, for all of your listeners to understand is when you see that in a friend, when you see that in a loved one, say something. Yes. You know, so often we will say once that person is gone or once something has happened, you know, I noticed that they just seemed lonelier. They seemed more, you know, separated from everybody. They weren't, Mm -hmm. you know, themselves. You know, those are times when you need to say, you know, you say that to them because oftentimes, and I, I will say most often, 
those people who are considering suicide are waiting. They are so desperate for someone to say, I see you, and I see that something is not right, and I want to help you, and I want to help you remember that your life, that your presence here with us is valuable to me. Um, and, and that sense of value uh, for so many is, is, is a key because for so many people, their reasoning behind taking their life is not wanting to be a burden. Final thing. Uh, you see people setting their affairs in order, or maybe they're rewriting a will or straightening out their finances suddenly, and uh, or maybe they're giving things away. I've heard that as well sometimes. Right. Um, those are things, again, that might be signs. Not Absolutely. necessarily are, but might be signs, and you need to almost have a sixth sense now to some of the things we've been talking about here, including that. Absolutely. You know, if you've got someone that's been going through a difficult time um, and, you know, or has been going through a really high period of excitement and all of a sudden start saying, you know, I'm, I'm going to start giving away all of my favorite things, yeah. not just things, my favorite things, the things that I love. I'm going to all of a sudden get a will for someone who's never been ill, somebody who's never, you know, maybe doesn't even have children. Mm -hmm. You know, why are we suddenly putting a will together? You know, just questioning things because so often people slide little things in and, you know, we get that little inkling in the right. back of our stomach, in the back of our head. What's that about? You know what? Verbalize that. What's that about? Why are you doing that? Why are all of a sudden you feel like you need to get your finances in order? That's great. But what's the reason behind it? And particularly, Gary, if they have been through a difficult time in the past year, um, you know, these are signs that maybe they're feeling like things aren't going to get better. So let me get my things in order just in case I have to make some decisions. And I thank you so much for joining us this morning. Truly a Absolutely. lot of great information. We, we thank you. And again, 1 800 273 talk. And please keep those lines of communication open. It is not hopeless and it's not the end of the day. Benet, thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. How about words of wisdom today from uh, Robin Williams when he said in uh, Dead Poet Society and quoting John Keating, Carpe, hear it? Carpe, Carpe Diem. Seize the day, boys. Make your lives extraordinary. And then also, no matter what anybody tells you, words and ideas can change the world. Tomorrow on the Gary Sutton Show, we'll have Joe Schnetz go on. We'll have more about Robin Williams, and we'll keep on what's going on in Iraq. Hope you have a great day out there. Thanks so much for joining me this morning. It's high noon.